How's it going? <laughs> it's going really well, Jeff. It's great to see you and thanks it's for coming. Great to see you too. I was just, uh, as you can imagine, predictably, I was um, uh, warming myself up going through Spotify, just listening to Channel Orange and feeling all of those feelings. Thank you for bringing those into my life. Oh, well, that, that was a long time ago, but... <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> those how, days. How, how does that feel to be part of, to, uh, not only to be part of history, because that's kind of a cliche question, but for it to be, now you can look back and it's like, wow, that's 11 years ago. That's, oh, like 12 years ago since the yeah. process began. Yeah. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't really feel like anything um, because it mm. happened 11 years ago. So I'm so used to having that album be such a crazy part of history. Mm -hmm. um, the first like five years, it just, it felt weird, you know, because everybody has imposter syndrome at the beginning of yeah. their career, you know? So it was like the first album I ever really engineered became this like uh incredible piece of music history and for a lot of people come up to me and they're like this is what i listened to in high school it's like they're this is what i listened to in high school album you know yeah. and uh that's really weird but and, and then um from my perspective we're just in there trying to do a good job and um not accidentally delete anything and uh so when people come with an energy of like it was something that I did that was super special. It just kind of feels weird to me because it was like, no, I was just there. You know what I mean? I was recording. I was making sure everybody was happy. No one was like, sometimes when you're the engineer, you're also the therapist or you're like people, two people get in a little argument and you try to resolve it. And you're like weaving to make sure everybody's happy. Is everybody um, comfortable? Is everybody's headphones working right? Like, um, but it was an incredible learning experience for me. And, um, with all the records that I mix these days, there's lessons that I learned through that period um, that, I mean, I just, I think about like, oh, this is the day I saw this producer do that thing. Or I can fly parts of a chorus really fast because this one person, you know, uh, uh, Omas Keith taught me how to like fly this section faster in this one set. You know what I mean? Just stuff like that. So that's how that's it feels to me. Yeah, it also makes me feel old because that, if that was so long ago, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, that was that was when you you were sort of like uh, Trevor here in the back, weren't you? Is you were at a studio, or had you just graduated to the role of sort of pro engineer? Yeah. And, so what happened yeah. was um, I started as an intern at East West Studios, and um, that's where we're at today. Um, and I did the classic uh, thing where you start as an intern, and then a runner, then an assistant engineer, and uh, so I'm like a classically trained engineer. Yeah. And uh, that was a blessing because I got to see all the great producers of the world as my time as an assistant engineer and kind of see how they operate in the studio. And uh, that's where I got my training. And then at the start of Channel Orange, this is when a Frank had just like a mixtape out. And uh, it wasn't like, oh, my God, we're working with Frank or whatever. I didn't really even know much about it. And yeah. I was just put on the session as the assistant engineer. And um I don't remember the timeline, but pretty soon after the whole album recording started, his engineer didn't show up one day and then they had me sit in and uh, Omas Keith, who I, I always bring this up, he's a uh, one of the producers on the album. He's like, oh, Jeff will just do it for today. And that was my moment. And, you know, like by that time, I'd already kind of like sharpened my sword pretty like I was always, uh, you know, doing extra time at the studio. I'd watched so many great engineers. I was I was starting to do that thing where um, you get to a point when you work at a really nice studio where a lot of the engineers come in aren't, even though you're assistant, you kind of like know a bit more than what some of them do, like excluding all the greats or whatever. If you're, if you're an assistant in a really high-end studio for long enough, your engineering chops get pretty solid, right? So I was just lucky that um, Frank felt like he could trust me. We had a good like, energy like that and um i think i made him laugh and so <laughs> i got i got the job and um i didn't know about this at the time but they just kind of like uh didn't have the other guy i don't remember why the guy didn't show up or whatever but they just didn't have him come in and then all of a sudden i was just the engineer on that project and that was a like a a thing that i did for the next five years i was um engineering for frank so yeah and that you kicked off the new the next phase of my life and i left the studio after that you know so now i was like we were still like recording at east west in a lot of those sessions but now i'm frank's engineer and uh now i feel really weird anymore. coming in and like oh yeah hi guys i'm a freelance engineer and yeah, you know. yeah but you know what that happens a lot so it's not like a, an okay. unheard of thing so what felt really weird is 
how that album won a Grammy and all of a sudden I had a Grammy and I was just this like brand new engineer and um, that felt really weird and I was kind of like embarrassed by it for a long time, you know, because a lot of the people I looked up to never uh, got a Grammy. A lot of it's luck based, you know, so. But that was a really appropriate reaction. That was like humility and it wasn't arrogance. Yeah, it wasn't it was like, like, hey, you guys, I did it before you, you know? Yeah, it was It was weird. Um, yeah. Yeah. I didn't really and, like, um, I haven't won a Grammy since, but some of the nominations I've gotten the last couple of years, I really felt like I deserved. So that felt good. So I've been able to, uh, you know, there was like a 10 year gap of no more nominations or whatever. And then we got one, I think we got one for like Doja Cat. And I felt like, okay, I like, I'll own this one. You know what I mean? I put in my, my decade of work for this one so and by that point you were over that imposter syndrome you were talking about yeah yeah the yeah. imposter the imposter i think it's it's always good to keep a little bit so you keep hungry you know what i mean yes. yeah, lately absolutely. i've been waking up early and spending an hour trying to relearn some modern production techniques and things that, like to make sure i don't you know um become an old hat you know what i mean so uh i keep a little bit, bit of, of it around um so i keep trying to get better because it's like the second you think that you're some sort of like mixed god or whatever it's like that's dumb and you're not and you're just gonna get bad so yeah and yeah. you mentioned that you learned like classically at uh at east west and i like to call I'm, it like classically trained engineer yeah <laughs> yeah and i'm guessing <laughs> was more traumatic was this about 08 09 i started at yeah it was uh 2009 i started at and i was a 25 year old intern yeah. yeah. And, and so you were probably, I think, the last generation to not have had any uh, influence from YouTube, watching YouTube videos about how to right. record and how That's to mix. That's a good point. Yeah. Do, do you yeah, think was, that, was that helpful? Well, um, there's a lot of people that do a lot of things very badly because they learn off the internet. There's so much great stuff on the internet and I'm in a position where I can filter it because... Um, I mean, I've seen as many YouTube tutorials as anybody on earth, you know what I mean? Yep. But because of my time in the industry, I can kind of filter between, oh, this is garbage. And then, oh, wow, this is actually something I should explore. Um, but there's a lot of stuff on YouTube that I completely disagree with. And I think it steers people in a really wrong direction. So it's kind yeah, of like a Can you give some examples? Uh, well, it's just like, I see um, like vocal tutorial type moves in the sessions I open like um for example I'm not a big believer in like getting stems I like to get DAW sessions so I, I I see what everybody's doing in their DAW sessions and um everybody's doing way too much and a lot of it I see kind of there's this culture um on YouTube and I've noticed it's really bad on TikTok where people who don't haven't really mastered the craft are giving um tutorials and advice and that, that, there's places where that's okay because there's some like basic stuff but um a lot of times people don't see the big picture so they end up doing way too much um i i see people like you'll see your like classic synth pop vocal chain thing and uh people will put that on like a ballad vocal when the, the arrangement of the song doesn't require a vocal to be smashed and the low and cut out and the highs boosted or whatever it's like um people get caught up in like a chain mentality and they learn a chain in a YouTube video and they don't necessarily like apply it to the arrangement of the song that they've produced. So that's something I see all the time. People just arguing about stuff that like does not matter um, at all, you know, and it, it's hard to pick out specifics in my brain. It's just like an sure. overall feeling of the internet is a great resource and I use it as much as anybody. I literally like last night trying to like get to the next level of um, like being an Ableton live user because we're always oh, yeah. using all the DAWs, right? But there's yeah. areas of Ableton that I use for mixing all the time, but there's other areas that I want to learn too. So I'm I'm on YouTube tutorials too, like design, you know what I mean? So it's an incredible resource, but I had the benefit of coming up the classic way where I observed in person the best of the best over time and I got to see what worked and what didn't and um I got to see like there's like the incredible engineers and then there, there'll be some like asshat engineers that would come in and put 15 mics on a piano and it would sound way worse than when the person put two mics on the piano or three you know yeah so you just kind of get to, you, you get to be a fly on the wall for the best of the best 
And that was cool about East West. It, it, it attracts every genre. Um, so it wasn't, I was just like at a rap studio or a rock studio or a country studio. It was like everything comes through here. Big classical um, string arrangement recording sessions and stuff like that. So that was yeah. instrumental for me. Um, so I think that's why when I like jumped in as the engineer on an album like Channel Orange that goes across multiple different genres and, and stuff like that, um, I was ready for the job because you'll, you'll get like a, an engineer that just cuts rap vocals that doesn't maybe know how to record drums so great or, you know, or you might get some like person who's only seen rock that doesn't know how to run a session that's more structured and like for how a rapper would work or whatever. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So I got to see like a, a like a, like a pro how you use Pro Tools is completely different for every genre that you're working in. Like if you've never been in a big orchestral scoring date, you won't understand the lingo of how they work or how they operate their sessions if you've only done you know a genre a completely different genre so yeah, yeah. this is absolutely it and there's a um, long answer no, no no it's 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 all good i mean it's um it's it, it's a great thing when you don't uh, have to keep putting 50p in the meter as as, as we would say but um <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the um the well, resource that I often cite on this podcast and that was really helpful to the people in my community uh, was is mixed with the masters. Yeah. But um, it's good because you get to see the kind of mm -hmm. process from start to finish. And um, I it. suppose yeah. ge gen generalize from that, that it's a mindset, not a task that you can repeat. I'll give an example to feed into what you were saying. Dave Pensado, the mm -hmm. great Pensado. You, uh, after Jason Joshua has, you know, henched up the instrumental mix, Pensado comes in and does the vocal and he just does this big low cut to 500, little uh -huh. dip, I, I think at four, and then a big yeah. brightness boost. And yeah. it would be really tempting as a new engineer to be like, okay, that's how you do a good vocal. I'll keep right, doing yeah. that on every mix. Yeah. And you see yeah. that a lot. Yeah, totally. Um, Vocal EQing should be about the arrangement of the song, you know, and colors that you're going for. Um, but yeah, and you, even like if you spend enough time with, and I'm guilty of this too, there's stuff that I've done in like kind of tutorial type things online that I don't even agree with anymore, you know, or I might, my way of doing things and mixing music is way different now than it was, you know, five years ago, or like things have changed in the last year. Um, and then there's even things I see like, I'll see like great people do think do stuff where I'm just like I don't agree with what you're doing here and I think in 10 years you won't be doing that anymore or in 10 years I'll be like I, I was wrong they were right all along so it's good to keep an open mind and um learn a lot from the people the learn a lot from the greats but don't just assume because they do it it is actually correct because we all learn bad habits and we all do things and, and eventually like we're like wait, wait why do I even do it this way you know hmm. Um, yes, you're always yeah. updating as well. So the audience yeah. needs to be ready for that too. Yeah, always updating. Yeah. I, yeah. You you talked about Ableton before and that really threw me because uh, I'm an Ableton user and yeah. my intuition was that it was not purely for, not purely designed for, but mostly uptaken by, taken up by artists because mm -hmm. the workflow is like fast, intuitive, yeah. you know, auditioning stuff is, you know, the file browser even is just, you know, amazing well, to have there. Yeah. Um, how does it work in a mix context? Because I, I can't, I, I would imagine having all well, of your, you know, the plugins are all on this tiny strip at the bottom. Is that not like frustrating? Yeah, well, how are you going to do a good mix for someone that works in the way that you described on Ableton if you don't have access to their session? You know what I mean? First yeah. of all, like almost every producer, um, even the best in the world, like I get everybody's stuff. So I work with people who are not the best. I work with people who are the best, like, no one knows how to stem out their stuff correctly. Like, even, I don't know why. I, like, I don't know why you can get this brilliant producer and like has invested zero time in how to make their, their stems sound like their production. Um, it just doesn't happen. Um, of course, there are some that get it, but I'm literally like 90% of the stuff we get when people send us stems. I'm like, this doesn't sound like your production. You're an incredible producer. Why does the the stems that you sent us not sound like your production? You know, as in the so, stereo mix would sound one way, but you stack all the stems on top of each other and it sounds exactly. a different way. Exactly. So right. there'll be like a good working rough mix of the production and the label and the artist. And everybody's like, okay, let's send this to mixing, and then I'll get stems, and I'll be like, this doesn't sound like the production. You know what I mean? So why would the first step of mixing be to just go backwards and try to build something off of stems up? 
it was like not even as good as where they produced the song. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, as a so mixer, I'll just turn the mix bus off first. <laughs> right. So as a mixer, it's like if you want to um, honor the producer's aesthetic, like you need to make sure you have to take like the Hippocratic Oath where like we're not going to do do any harm to this production. We're going to make everything better. Um, and some songs have room to make things better, like a lot of room. And then some some is like, damn, this is so perfect. Like we have to make sure everything is preserved and nothing is lost from moving it from one creative party to the next you know what i mean mm-hmm. so like so how do you make stems for a mixer then because it's really confusing and um just the act of you know you might have a producer where clipping the ableton bus is 40 percent of the aesthetic of everything the way that an 808 or a drums grind into the clipping um on ableton sounds different than when you grind into the clipping on logic and pro tools like i've t- i've literally tested this with the the guy um, Bill, who's like heads up the Ozone development team at Isotope, mm-hmm. like all the DAWs clip differently. We've tested it, and the subtle nuance of the way your production is clipping might be a huge part of the way the record is produced. And if you lose that, it's like the character you can never get that back. Mm-hmm. Um, or you can try to simulate it, but it doesn't quite work out. Like I was mixing a bunch of hundred Gex stuff last year, and the nuance of the way that they clip their productions and how they distort them is like everything. So if my first thing is to like move in, I'm the mixer now and just like mess up the production by um, ignoring that important element of how music is produced nowadays, that would be a complete fail. So um, I mean, the the, the most classic thing where people mess up their stems is like an Ableton if they just uh, do the automatic function where you, you can kind of stem it out in order, but then I think that ignores groups or it like different DAWs. It can ignore side chains or it can ignore like if you're using sends. And then what's going on on the stereo bus of a production is also extremely important to the production a lot of times too. Sometimes it's making it worse. And sometimes if you get rid of that, what's on the stereo bus uh, that the producer had, now their whole aesthetic falls apart. So you have to go through these things and be like, this is important, this isn't, this is adding to character, this isn't. And when they have to start like removing a bunch of stuff just to start mixing, it's like, it's not the right move. So we, we've put a, a lot of effort into getting computers going with like so many plugins and uh, learning enough of each of the major DAWs to where we can um, pull up their DAW session, just see what's going on inside of it. A lot of times um, I'll pull up a producer's DAW session that, you know, bounce the latest rough mix that everybody likes and we get it all opening up perfectly. And sometimes it takes a little back and forth, but more often than not, it's way easier than you think. It's just expensive for plugins, but you can have people freeze things. And, and most people use mostly the same plugins and you have them freeze their virtual instruments. And so you got this, this DAW session open and you can be like, okay, this is what's going on in their stereo bus. That's important. We need to leave this. We, a lot of times there'll be like an SSL bus compressor doing way too much and just bypassing that all of a sudden, like with doing one button, um, it, it's like the, the mix just got better. Like it can mm-hmm. be sometimes 20% and people are often misusing stuff. Um, sometimes people always overuse soothe on their stereo bus. Um, so a lot of times we'll just bypass that. Oh, the mix got better. Um, and does the soothe time, cause the does the the soothe cause the mix when overused to sound really scooped and kind of? Well, what you know. what it does is the way that I think soothe is probably a great tool if you really know how to use it well. And I'm I'm actually going to talk to them soon about like what we can do to get people to stop misusing it. Mm-hmm. But um, soothe works in a way that a lot of times it's like messing with the dynamics and movement of. Uh, the sound of your song so however it's engaging in terms of whatever like kind of attack and release um it's doing to dip out what it thinks is a problem frequencies a lot of times it just tramples on the um the pocket and the movement of a song uh because it's like adjusting the dynamics in a strange way that people aren't being aware of Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's generally it's like when people are overusing soothe it looks really cool because a bunch of lines are wiggling in front of your face but when you're not attached to any plugin like I am I can just see when when someone has been diluting themselves or when it's actually making a difference and a lot of times you'll change one plugin on a stereo bus and then all of a sudden the rough mix went from like 
um, like a C to a B. And then you find another thing that can take it from the B to a B plus, and then hopefully to an A. Um, but along the way, you want to make sure that you're uh, protecting the producer's um, aesthetic. Now, there's times in mixing where the aesthetic is not great. And a lot of that needs to be built up. And you can be a lot more invasive, but still, um, you want to start working from a place that is kind of where the artist and the producer left off. And the best way to do that is open their DAW session and not rely on uh, printed stems because, you know, you can make a big difference in a mix by using the same reverb they had that really fits with the production. But, you know, maybe it needs a little bit longer pre-delay because it was like trampling on the vocalist singing. Or a lot of times people are just over EQing and over compressing. You can get into the DAW session and dial that back a little bit. Then if you want to work in Pro Tours or whatever, you can sit and print the stems in a way where you know it's going to work best for yourself. And you're going to be able to preserve um, everything that you want to preserve and like remove what you want to remove. Because like in the modern era of production at my level, if you get all the stems 100% dry, the production has moved way too far backwards you've uh, removed all the production aesthetic the artist is going to hate that um if you're working with like a new band in the middle of nowhere and they're terrible and maybe dry stems is the move i don't know but at the level that i'm working at it's just not the move so but then getting 100 percent wet stems even if they do match the um the rough mix perfectly because they were uh printed properly uh you might have a situation where like the vocal sounds pretty good, but it's a little bit, just, just a little bit too compressed. But if they made a hundred percent dry, it would be just like a mess at that point. But it's like, damn, I wish like the vocals perfect, but a little bit more attack or like a faster release. Um, if I could adjust the threshold a little bit, just to make it a little bit more emotional and dynamic, that's what you can do by getting under the hood in people's DOS sessions and kind of doing it. So we have um, this computer that I'm sitting at right now, is called our premix computer and it has like every plugin on it it's really robust it has all the DAWs and I'll sit down and I'll go through DAW sessions and we call it the premix and then I'll decide should this stay in this DAW and just mix it in the DAW or should I move it to Pro Tools I'm most comfortable in Pro Tools and it works really well with my um, Avid console so I like to move things into there but we can stem it out a way in a way that's gonna be great for me um, but I can still get under the hood and optimize the plugins that they were using and then bypass anything that I think I could do better or differently. Um, and since we started doing that, it, it's uh, you, you stop getting the, oh, the rough mix was better or there's something about the rough mix I really liked. That's That generally is what happens when people go too dry and the stabs are try to change too much when they needed, didn't need to. Um, and it's and it's still an optimal workflow for when you really need to dig in and make it completely different from the rough mix you can start bypassing stuff that's not serving the music but then keep some of the effects that you really like um and then just go from there so i saw leslie uh breathwaite Bre breath how do you say his name i know who you're anyway. talking about but i'm not gonna barth wait i don't know i'll mess it up too but i know who you're talking about the guy who mixed happy and made everyone happy with that mix yeah um wow. He was saying um, that he calls it demoitis. You know, people get really, really attached to the first thing they hear, even if they kind of know that it sucks or it's not optimal. Um, there's like, oh, there's some the demos doing something that I just, I'm, I'm in love with now. And so you have thrown, um, or East West have thrown an awful lot of money at solving that problem because to stack a a single machine, stack a single PC or Mac with yeah. all of the plugins you could possibly imagine will be a significant investment, right? <laughs> well, kind of. For, I mean, I did this. So this is all my gear. So I okay, paid so for all this stuff over the years. But it started out, I mean, I was able to achieve this without an insane amount of money. It's just, and it's easier nowadays because you can get Wave subscription, uh, plug, yep. like between Waves, Plugin Alliance. Um, there's so many of these, uh, like so many of these, Plugin manufacturers have ways you can get it for cheap. And then we do, you know, so I, I get paid pretty good to mix a song. And so if I have to spend $300 of that to get a, a plugin that I know this same producer that I'm going to work with all the time has, it's like a smart investment and you do it over time. But I'm, I'm telling you, it seems extreme. It's not as bad as you think. And it has the added benefit of you do way better mixes for people. So they want to work with you again. 
And almost mm-hmm. everybody I do it this way with is like, thank God, like, w- like I've always wanted to do this way. I, I didn't think it was possible or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's extremely rare that this doesn't end up being the optimal way. And it's way less expensive now than when I had to do it in the past. This sounds like an example of one of those places where you have evolved your perspective over time because I think I was just um, before this doing a bit of prep watching some, okay. one of your yeah. um, talks at uh, MixCon, I think it may have been okay. called. Yeah. And, you know, I think you said, you know, wet stems is the preferred way of doing it. And uh, yeah. is, was that once your view? Well, that was my view, meaning that wet stems over dry stems in most okay. cases. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if this isn't an option to do the DAW thing, and I, I don't think back then I was like maybe on the like do the DAW thing quite yet. Um, but if you if you only have one choice between one or the other, depending on what genre you're in and this and that, there's some factors like, again, I don't want someone to hear this and be like, this is the rule for everything. It's not like the number one rule is every new artist you work with and every new producer you work with, um, tailor a strategy to work best with the producer and the artist, like what works best for them and come up with a strategy for how you're going to do files. Okay. So that's the biggest thing. So don't stick to any rule. Um, a new artist comes in, new producer, see how they're making the song or whatever and form a strategy for how to to mix it and how to do files or whatever. That's step one. Uh, Back in the day, I feel like I would rather in most productions have wet stems over dry because completely dry just moves everything back to... I mean, if you you take a modern production and just bypass every plugin, there's not even a song anymore. You know what I mean? It's just a a mess of junk. So that's like not worth it. If, If you're recording like a country band and it's drums, lead guitar, keyboard, it's B3 or whatever, sure, you could do remove everything and it'll still be a song more or less you know what i mean and you can the characters the in the room there not in the box yeah yeah and it's also like it's pretty straightforward like a lot of the stuff that i mix would is kind of like on the the edge of what's new and what's even music sometimes you know what i mean mm. so you can't just do a faders down or whatever they call it <laughs> um if i'm doing uh just a straight up rock band maybe you could pull that off you know what i mean because plugins aren't necessarily so much of the aesthetic but it's all about forming a strategy um and a lot of times like if people are complaining that the they just miss the rough i I hate to break it to you if you're watching this it probably was better than your mix and i think most mixers are pretty bad and uh, most producers are better um mixers than the people that call themselves mixers because like man to be a good mixer you have to essentially be better at mixing almost every producer's music that you know what I mean it's like and it took yes. me a decade you know what I mean it's not like I was good at mixing when I started yeah. I was terrible for a long time and I still get better every year um but the task so is often, to intuit their style and be able to present exactly. it back to them better than they can do it yeah and what generally happens is um a mixer will be like think of the thing in like such a technical way and like, oh, we got to clean this up. These drums don't sound like Steely Dan. We got to do this. Oh, the thing is clipping here. That's a bad. Uh, uh, supposedly, I learned that. And then they just end up doing like an engineering mix, and it's just not as cool. Like you have to be able to. It's all art and taste at the end of the day, and having great taste in art takes a long time to develop. And you're not necessarily born with that. You just have to surround yourself with great music and art and kind of live that life for a long time. And then you can start to see um, the bigger picture of things. So there's you said, plenty of, what's up? You said an engineering mix. Now I'm guessing what you mean is kind of like the idea that there's an objective way to treat it, but you think like an artist, right? right when mixing. You have to. Yeah. If, yeah. I mean, if you, if you're sitting here, there'll be people like, well, if we put a, the drums through a Fairchild the, the drums are better now. You know what I mean? That's technically like, right. Yeah. No, it's not technically right. It <laughs> what the technically right thing was be okay. You put a Fairchild on the drums. Now the drums are different. You know what I mean? But maybe the the drums were too warm or whatever to begin with. Maybe the transients were not there to begin with, and now you even rounded off more transients, and the drums are even more dead. You know what I mean? But there's like a a thing where it's like, oh, we're gonna. I, we, I always called it we're putting some shit through some shit. You know, you go into the studio. People still, you used to hear it more back in the day, but people would come into a nice studio just to put some shit through some shit. Like, yeah, if we put, if the vocal just had a an, an, uh, real LA 2A on it or like a real Fairchild or whatever, suddenly it's a better vocal. And it's like, 
maybe it, it, generally it's just different you know what i mean now it sounds different um but you know like a good mixer will do a better mix with just volume faders than uh, a bad mixer having every tool you know so uh, the number one thing is people look at mixing as like a technical pursuit and it's not like you need to know the technical parts of like when you're painting a picture like how do you hold a paintbrush there's like a technique to holding a paint paintbrush right i don't know what it is but i'm sure there's a technique of when to use the small brush and the big brush and how to mix up your paints or whatever that's what's learning the technique of engineering and mixing is all about but once you're holding the paintbrush and it's time to paint there's no technical thing anymore like all those rules you have to master the the foundations of technique so you can know when to break them and know when to zoom out and see um the like the whole of a piece of art like knowing when what level to have a vocal at, out isn't like there's no technical thing about that it's like at what level do i get goosebumps when this one word is at this one volume that's all about connecting with how you feel and emotion and then like when to know where when a distorted mess is just feels better than something clean and beautiful like um but but yeah it, it's like you gotta know the technique and then get ready to break it and then trust in your own aesthetic and vision and that's something you just build up over the years and then you also have to it's so often that i'll do a mix and i'll listen to the rough mix I, uh, rough mix better let's try this a different way you know what i mean sometimes you do a whole you do like you, you got to also as a great mixture you got to be the one who knows when yep this is this rough mix is magic we're not touching it so you do a whole out like most albums i do there'll be one or two songs where um i change a bunch of st stuff and then there's like the, the medium where it's, there's a bunch of mediums and then there'll be a couple where it's like that rough is magic like i what would i do you know what i mean i think my job on this one is to make sure no one messes it up and just goes with that you know mm -hmm. or it'll be one of those things i'll open up the dos session like this rough mix is perfect but if i can just hear an ssl compressor doing too much on the stereo bus let's just bypass that and i guarantee you it'll be perfect you know you have to be ready to do everything or nothing and that just comes from being an artist and a lover of music and being able to fall into the daydream of a song and that's something you need to work on over time. And and then you have to be ready to look at your own mix and be like, this is junk. You know what I mean? Yeah. Try it again, you know? Yeah, not like this is finished or, I, you know, I've I've spent a long time on it, therefore it's right. finished. Yeah, there, yeah. yeah it's, it, you, have to, you have to be ready to not get emotionally attached to having spent a long time on something because you could do a mix, spend a long time on it, then listen to it down, listen to the rough and be like, oh, the, the, the rough is more emotional just feels better and then you just have to delete your mix and either reapproach and sometimes you reapproach it and you do way less and then you have something that really beats the rough and everybody's super happy you know yeah uh, so yeah it's it's a really difficult strategy game every time you mix a song um yeah. and the biggest thing is to, to is just always respect magic so if you hear magic in a rough mix where's that magic coming from don't touch that you know what i mean and if you hear a rough mix and it's like, oh, I feel like there should be this more magic in this section. It's just not there. That's what you go after, you know? It's um, it, it, it's tempting or yet it's easy to kill the goose that laid the golden egg, you know, yeah. uh, by, you know, I don't know. I can't, I, like you were saying before, I can't think of any examples immediately of, but you sense, when you sense that magic in a rough mix. But I know there have been times where, um, you know, I've seen songs being produced or tracks being produced, and it hits this kind of magic sweet spot. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's te and and what happens is they go, okay, cool. Now that's the base layer, and they pile on top of right. that, and you lose yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And do do you sometimes try and excavate and bring something back that was lost? Yeah. If I, well, if I get a song that there's way too much going on, I will sit with the artist or the producer and be like, um let's try to mute some stuff and see what happens. You know what I mean? And we'll right. go through, I'll get them down to the studio. I'd be like, this might make sense in your brain. Cause you've heard this song on loop a million times. And maybe you went to Berkeley and you, you <laughs> like, like listen to a lot of advanced music or whatever. Like I have like a very basic music brain. So mm. if I'm getting too much, it like triggers something in my brain where like, I'm confused. I don't know what's happening. I call them fire hose beats when there's just like, you're hit with the fire hose and like try to drink from a fire hose. So it's like, um, your brain as a song loops right you put down a part and then it hits that magic zone and usually when it's just a couple things very minimal 
And then you, your brain goes on loop and then it commits that to memory. So then it starts, the magic will start to drift. It'll be a little boring to your brain. It's like, oh, let's, it's feeling a little boring here because you've listened to it 50 times. Let's add another thing. And then that'll eventually get boring. And eventually you have a fire hose beat. Um, so luckily it's like you have a bunch of good stuff in there and you can sit in the studio with the mixer and um, start muting stuff and messing around with the arrangement. And a lot of times, all of a sudden, everything will come alive with some strategic mutes. And most producers and artists aren't too married to every little thing. And they can kind of start to get a sense like maybe if the if a good mix isn't coming right away, it's like, hmm, if a good mix isn't coming right away, I'm like, maybe it's an arrangement thing. So I start just muting parts of the song and you'll like mute a thing and all of a sudden, Wow, and the whole song. There it is. Up. Yeah, and now I'm connecting with the vocal. Like, a lot of songs will have a vocal narrative. Like, and right when you mute the right amount of things, your brain starts to catch the lyrics and the narrative, and that gives you the emotion because you can fall into the daydream of the song when you're like yeah. locked in the vocal. So, yeah. Look, something something Andrew Sheps said on this podcast is he, it, it changed the way I think about this and and when I listen for this in other mix engineers yeah. when they talk now for the rest of my life is that uh, he revealed to me that he's not using his ears to make decisions. He's right. using his ears to, you know, to to what assess what he's doing, but yeah. it's it's a feeling. It's when it but, feels yeah. right. That's yeah. it, that's the radar. And you just said, you know, you'd hit that strategic muting. You do the strategic muting. You'd mute something off and you go, ah, there's the feeling. I yeah. just got that, you know, those goosebumps. Yeah, Andrew Sheps is 100% right about that. And, mm -hmm. uh, I'm the same way. So when people are like, oh, you have like magic ears. It's like, no, I don't trust me. I don't hear any better than anybody else. Um, I've just like practiced the discipline of falling in, letting my like, letting me feel it, like working off a of feeling like anytime I'll be writing something. I'm like, this sounds good. I'll like delete. I'm like, this feels good. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, so yeah, that's such, that's all it is. Like when you're mixing a dance song, you need to be feeling how your body moves to the pocket of a song, right? Uh, or even like any song you need to listen like how when you're doing percussion like how does this make my body move you'll catch yourself if you pay attention and like oh I just did a thing and now I'm moving this way but sometimes I'm like oh my body's moving this way but I want it to move a little bit different so I'll play with things and then um, and, and then you're like bouncing to the song in a different way um, like I said like with a guitar solo it's like there's no magic like guitar solo should be 3 dB louder than the rhythm guitar is like no, you just have to start um, writing it until you feel like a guitar hero. You know what I mean? That's the kind of stuff that you need to be looking for. And you need to be approaching mixing that way. And uh, that's when you stop being like a technician. And, um, you know, you'll be surprised if you follow your body and your feelings and your emotion. You'll do stuff that the technician brain um, th thinks is like, well, this is weird. Like, this can't be legal to do this in a mix, right? I'm writing a book right now and I, I have this thing, it's called Mixer Brain, right? The, the person using Mixer Brain is like not what you want. When you're in like Mixer Brain, uh, for example, if you listen to like Song 2 by, by Blur, right? Mixer Brain would tell you that the first drop in that song is like way too loud and like the intro drums are way too quiet, right? But then like when you're out of Mixer Brain, when you're normal person brain, you listen to that and the drop is epic and now it's like getting a whole sports stadium to get on their feet right so you got to kill your mixer brain um that's like the number one thing to and it's hard it takes a long time to uh people are so scared when they have mixer brain you know like yep um to bring it back to uh to channel orange there's a song on or there's a song on the album where um the the vocal was just like to bring back a fair child again, I think it was like over saturating in a fair child. Right. And it was giving it, um, uh, this like, like this crunchiness and it was giving it this white noise and all these things that like an engineer would be like, Oh no, I just ruined uh, this engineering. Right. And then <laughs> this is how it was back in the day. And everybody's like guilty of this. Like the album comes out and I hear, and I'm like, the, I'm listening to the song and I hear like, uh, a white noise and the vocals like breaking up in points. I'm like, oh my God, I'm like a fraud engineer. Everybody's going to hear this and think I'm terrible. And then literally like that day, someone DMs me and they're like, how did you get that vocal sound on that one song? And I was like, 
Oh my God. Okay. So uh, that, that had in like a eureka moment. I, I was like, wow. So one person's like, it, once it comes out on a record, it's art, right? So that distortion and the, the vocal breaking up in a certain way, that triggered an emotion for that listener. Whereas if I'm in mixer brain or like at that point I was the engineer. So I was just being like nerdy engineer kid freaking out about it. Like, well, this thing I was freaking out about, it was like this other this other person's like favorite part of the record. So, um, and when you start zooming out, you, you can start seeing how all these little things that we fear as engineers and mixers are actually what people love the most about music. So, yeah. yeah. And this is, I mean, an, an example that comes to mind for me from Channel Orange that seemed like classically you would be told that it was wrong uh, in the old way might be um, a fertilizer, you know, because it's like it's, it's really narrow and very distorted. It brings so many strong feelings when even when it plays in my mind. But yeah, so it's like whatever that was it is. Uh, ex- so no one in the studio would have been like thinking about that, you know what I mean? But then everybody channels it in their own way. Right. So once it comes out, like I see people like still argue about mono compatibility on forums and like whatever 2023 or whatever like it's like everybody just relax for a second you know what i mean it's like yeah no one no one gives a fuck you know what i mean it's like have fun and do cool art and once it comes out on the record it's music you know your engineering yeah. mistakes i mean there's a limit to where like it's just bad you know what i mean but you just got to be aware um, make sure you're listening to your own music and your own mu- uh, productions in the same way that you listen to other people's stuff when you're just being a fan, you know? When yeah. you're listening to an album as a fan, you're so open-minded to how the music feels. You're naturally doing that thing when you're letting your emotion listen, right? But the second mm-hmm. you transition into mixer brain or engineer brain, suddenly you're 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 listening in a completely different way that is not natural, um, and will be the detriment to your art. So right, right. So yeah. we're we're in Manchester here, and one of our mu- musical giants is Morrissey. Um, whatever people think of him lately, definitely okay. a landmark figure. And he said this really. Uh, he said something that stuck with me. But I thought it was quite insightful for a young man of his age when he was twenty four. Uh, you know, he said, "However you dress becomes your look. That's like your trademark image. And right. you, you, you could be wearing nothing and that would become a trademark image, but that becomes your look. He was referring to the fact that he didn't really design this kind of famous quiff and like loose shirt. Yeah. It's just, just what he wore. And yeah. what I'm, I suppose, I'm, I'm tying that to this idea of more artist brain than mixer brain. It's like the record sounds how it sounds. It's not like there's right and there's wrong and you're trying to get it closer to right. It sounds like- the way it sounds. And like you said, people, when people are fanatical exactly. about the music, when they love it, that's the precondition for them to be like, whatever it sounds like, I will accept. Yeah. You yeah. Know, within limits, like you said. But, uh, you know, I, Blonde is a great example of that, right? You know, um, not that it's unconventional in many ways, you know, like in White Ferrari, there's these very present vocals that are nonetheless very far away and mix a brain to someone inexperienced like me would be like, that's a wrong decision, you know, but it's yeah. perfect. Yeah, Frank doesn't get mixer brain. <laughs> I can imagine. But yeah, just watching him work was such a great lesson to me because I could. Um, he, he's just naturally just pure art walking through the world. So I've had to work at it. <laughs> Some people get it naturally, I guess. But uh, yeah, I'm so em- I am so envious of him for that reason because, as as you said, it does seem to be just an. an natural effervescent like beauty that is like his his persona you know it's not like a costume he wears yeah i don't i don't know i don't know like i don't know if he has to work at it or not but it always seems so natural for me you know yeah um, so do you, yeah, ever I, get, um, do you ever get um ever get that frustration where people you know so you, you talked about watching frank work and my imagination conjures up images of maybe go, you know going to a desk and trying something and moving something around yeah and you know it's like oh you're not even like listening for right and wrong it's just like messing around until you're up, until something happens yeah well i i don't even like you know I, most people i ask me but i don't really talk too much about what he does in the studio because he just prefers to be private about everything you know of course yes but um i've been able just to take so many lessons about my life he's just a fearless artist you know Fear is the fear will. I think everybody inside of them has a 
uh, something to say artistically. And the only thing that stands in the way of that is fear. And um, I never saw him question his own instincts one time in five years that I worked with him. Um, but on the flip side, I work with a lot of people who are always questioning themselves and I see how that damages them. Um, so my advice to the world is just take a very fearless approach in your music or just don't bother writing it because you're not re you haven't really cut to the core of who you are as an artist if you're coming up against well you, everybody's going to feel fear I, I feel like um but you have to push through that yeah you feel it observe it and let it go because um when you let go of your your fear there's going to be something purely artistic inside of you that um can do something special that people will connect with and uh and then just have patience because it's not going to happen overnight um it's something it's you, something comes up in mixing all the time like if you have fear of doing a good job on the mix that the, in, the universe is kind of designed if you're scared of something happening it's going to happen right it's the Taoists say like what you resist persists right the same thing um shows up on the mixing board uh i saw ryan hewitt was over in studio five mixing the chili peppers and he had a copy of the Tao Te ching uh sitting on the console a little one um and that's uh that's a, that's something that people should read if they're worried about um giving their art into the world you know so the the world seems to only accept people when they have abandoned that fear i think so too and uh, you know yes it's it's like or push through it you know what i mean yeah if you're a very fearful person don't think that you can't be a great artist you just gotta walk into it you know yeah i mean there's an there's a, a great example that comes to mind for me james murphy lcd sound system okay you know, he described spending all of his 20s in you know no, I'm not uh, in a state of, in a funk of confusion and like I stopped making music and all my bands failed. And so, you know, yeah. and he, it was, and, and I, I get the sense that there was always an attempt to, and you may have seen this and probably have seen this in your career, an attempt to guess what people wanted and try and be that. And then it didn't, it didn't happen for him until he went, oh, fuck it. Here's a really angry seven minute yeah. song with no chorus. And it's, yeah. and you know, it's a, it's a real expression. It's not an attempt to impress. Yeah. Well, same thing with that. Another callback that Blur song, song two, mm. was just like a screw around song, and they made it as like a joke. I saw in an interview recently, and then that's probably their biggest song. Um, my, I'm I'm friends with the band The Neighborhood who have that song Sweater Weather, and that was their first song. They were just kids screwing around in the studio, like not taking any of it seriously, and that's still I think in the Spotify top fifty like ten years later. Um, some people, when you're not consciously trying to achieve something can accidentally achieve it it's kind of the same way it's like um if you're if you're trying to impress someone it's not gonna if you're if like you're in trying to impress someone and get a date they're probably not going to be attracted to you right but if you like don't need th that date from them they might even be more attracted to you just be you know what i mean the universe yeah. has a weird polarity like that if you try to sell something to someone it's going to push them away but if you're over in the corner, like doing something cool, they'll probably like come to you, you know, it's the same yes. thing with music. I think these things are like written into the laws of the universe and they yes. can't be broken. Yeah. Um, so, but, and it's funny, that's why life is beautiful because getting in tune with the, those basic laws of the universe can take a lifetime, you know, yeah. uh, it, it can take so many years just to not care if someone likes your mix or not, you know, cause you really <laughs> want them to like it. Yeah. Um, but to do your best mix ever, you have to be in the flow state and you can't get into a flow state if you're scared. Um, so you get this like you're in this weird cycle of how do I how do I make this beautiful art when I'm scared because I'm scared of not making beautiful art. And since I'm scared, I can't do it. And now I can't even like connect. And then I don't even know what music is all of a sudden, you know? Yeah. So. And you can lose uh, uh, you can lose years <laughs> doing that once you get past yeah. a certain age. It's yeah, like but you I'll can do also it. break out of it at any age in your life too. So, like you said, with the LCD sound system, uh, yeah, the, 
Because I think that is something that hobbles people. It's like, oh, well, if I'm going to be a mu- an artist and a musical one, especially, it's like, mm-hmm. well, it has to be by the time you're 21, like John Paul, George and Ringo or whatever. Or after that, it's not real or it's immature. Yeah. And That's you not just, true. Like, yeah, yeah. If you're doing music based on youthfulness eventually that's going to run out but if you're doing music based on like the core fundamentals of what it means to be a human that career can persist forever you know yeah yeah so let's um briefly talk about the uh the now and the future um uh is there anything that you're allowed to discuss that you're currently working on or anything that's recently dropped, let's say, that you're, you know, happy to uh, have out there. And I'm really having a great time working with this artist called David. It's like spelled D4VD. You've probably heard a lot of his music. Um, he is absolutely an inspiring young artist. And um, he's like had some stuff on TikTok blow up, not to make him sound like some TikTok artist or whatever, because I feel like mm. that's starting to have like a negative connotation. Um, but I've had some stuff come out with him recently that I really liked. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to talk about what's coming up in the future because you never know like who wants their stuff to be out there. Yeah, of course. Um, but yeah, so I'm you always were talk. Oh, go ahead. Well, no, I was about to pir- pirouette. So you finish your thought. I think I was finished. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were talking before about, um, the sound, the different sounds of clipping, on different doors and yeah. something that you know i used to be a great uh kind of sounds bad i was i, I was gonna say i used to be a great admirer of steve albini i still am an excellent he's an excellent okay. engineer but i mean i used to live by every word that he said and okay. um you know he was critical of at one point uh analog emulation as in saying well it's basically just a distortion it's like a, it's like a, a problem a limitation of old technology that they were trying to work past yeah but the p- point is we all live and die now by analog emulation it is the Wait. same that, as you said if you turned uh, a lot of that off on a lot of mixes you'd have no character left because a lot of it's coming from the blend of different analog flavors yeah um do you think that we're going to hit a point in the future like that where we start trying to get this kind of clipping sound back uh, in a digital environment that s- simulates ableton that simulates cubase i mean you already said 100 gex it, i talked digital- to the, the yeah. i talked to the guy developing ozone i'm like can we please do a plug-in that uh, models the characteristics of all the major um DAWs you know that would be very helpful for me I would love that which would be probably pretty easy um yeah if that would be great I would love that um but you know uh, for the time being we're just gonna clip the DAWs as they were so yeah Yeah. but it's like when you know when people do like the analog digital thing again it's just paintbrushes right it's like it's like you're arguing over what paintbrush is like use the paintbrush that you like and then you can make the worst songs and the best songs with any paintbrush you know so it's a it's, yeah. a, it's a stupid like steve albini albini school or whatever but like if he was anybody that gets like super hard lined on anything it's like calm down <laughs> you know well yeah it's a limitation and not an arbitrary limitation here it can yeah. be and um, it's like you were saying, you know, there's, uh, there's, there can often be these debates going on online about, you know, how to uh, how to get the proper mono conversion or things like that. And I heard a quote recently that uh, if people have business worth minding, they'll mind their own business. And I feel like the real pros don't get into debates. They're just doing it, you know, and yeah. they don't have they have nothing to prove or in, and no one to impress. I suppose. I've, everything I've ever worked on in my entire career, I've not given one single fuck about mono compatibility. It's going to sound like shit in mono no matter what. So there you go. Enjoy it. You know? (laughs) Okay. And um, we're coming up on on the hour now. It's been an electrifying discussion. Um, I'm electrified. (laughs) Are you electrified? He's electrified as well. You're trying to hand some knowledge on to the next generation in this way. You've got interns in the studio. Is there anything else you're doing to try and pass on what you know apart from just talking to idiots like me? Um... Well, when I'm in the, the studio with artists, I try to pass on the knowledge, you know what I mean? Um, if I see them like routinely like over compress, the, the amount of people, artists that I told stop over compressing their vocal and then they stop doing it and it was amazing. Yeah. Um, like it's a lot like, and then they text me like, oh, it's amazing. You know, um, I told Tim Henson, like great, crazy guitar player, like, 
a few years ago, he came in and played me some of his stuff and his guitar was so compressed. I'm like, you're like the greatest guitar player on earth. Why are you like removing all the dynamics from your playing? Cause you're like a guitar God. And he's like, Hmm. And then he stopped doing that. And he was like, this is amazing. I was like so much better now. Thank you. You know what I mean? It's funny. <laughs> yeah. Just like, don't compress people. Like you can, if you want to try it out, but I would recommend everybody doing music at home, like production and stuff like for your next song you write, don't use a single compressor just to hear what that sounds like. And then you can know like the extreme of one end. Um, and then you can massage back a little bit where needed. So, and you'll get to see like, whoa, some of that like sound that I've been chasing is just the sound of not doing anything. This is yes. so common. If you're a well, great yeah. vocalist, a guitarist, whatever, let your dynamics speak. You know, that's in music, you have like timbre and timing and then pitch or whatever. And then you have your dynamics. And that's the biggest. You know, if I started like, if I was like, Trevor, I hate you or whatever, that wouldn't like scare him. But if I shouted that same thing at him, yes. he would feel the emotion, right? But everybody yeah. just wants to like compressor on compressor on compressor on compressor. And then they have a lifeless vocal with mouth clicks everywhere. And people think that <laughs> compressors make things bigger. They don't. Compressors make things smaller, right? And then maybe it can like do that and cut through some stuff maybe. But like it makes things compressors just zooming out really far like not to get into the nuance of things for the most part compression is a trade-off of emotion for just dynamic range control right so or ease of not having to automate things in in, in some ways you can like use it to transient shape to make things big or whatever yeah but for the most part think if you start thinking about compression as a, an exchange of emotion for ease of controlling dynamic range you you'll stop grabbing for it all the time you know what i mean yeah um and then you'll only grab for it when it's really necessary or use way less because like every time you're doing a, a ballad right when the singer digs in if it hits a wall you're yes it's now it's not all over the place but you just chopped off a bunch of emotion when the, the vocalist is ready to soar it and went plop on the ground in front of you so think of compression as like a ratio between emotion and ease of use and uh, right. and then ease it back in as necessary and I imagine it what's up I, I was gonna say i imagine it happens a lot more now because every you know artists all have access to plugins Constantly. and all home studios so two, you can really yeah it'll be two compressors on uh a vocal and then there'll be a third one that is like kind of like some multi-band fuckery that you don't need and then <laughs> yeah. that'll all be routed to a group that has another compressor on it. And then all that will be on the stereo bus, which will have a bus compressor and a, a like an inflator and then a maximizer and then a limiter. And then yeah. it's like, why is my thing sounding dead? It's like, you don't need any of that, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, you've, you've choked um, all of the air out of it. Yeah, I like, yeah. So, I mean, I'm not saying you don't ever use compressor, compressors or limiters or whatever, but practice using none of that just to see and feel what that sounds like. You'll be surprised what you can get away with. And then when you ease it back in, you'll you'll be doing it more intelligently because you'll know, um, you'll start to feel the relationship of emotion to just uh, control of dynamic range. Yeah, that was real. I mean, I'm no mix engineer. I always feel embarrassed even bringing up that we make music um, at our business in front of these pros. But the point is, it is the, the, the big the big shift was learning that it, you, you do it with a feather, not with a hammer, with with dynamic control. Yeah, our, and then yeah. of course, like I said, there's no rules. So sometimes you can be, you can do the hammer too, right? Don't take anything that I say as like, this is the rule. Yeah. Um, everything is flexible, yeah. Trevor has no. these glasses sitting on the table right here. What is this about? Well, that is presumably that that's like we've just seen Oppenheimer, uh, you know, come out. That's the kind of thing they're wearing at the Trinity test. So hopefully you're not. You know. Imagine if this was my um, just my look, you know, it, it's converted you into an agent from the Matrix. Right yeah. Agent Order. Jeff. We're compress. Never compress. <laughs> the We just got the front cover of Jeff's upcoming book, Mix of Brain. It's going to be with those glasses. Yes. It's the back so cover. We, yeah. <laughs> Hey, one more question on that, by yeah. the way, on a mi on a mix of brain thing. Um, yeah. One of my producers got really, really good, and you know, compared to me in the last year at mixing. But yeah. immediately, uh, there was a temptation to be like, um, 
you know, a, a client wants uh, wants some more of a certain instrument, and it's like, well, there's no more room. You know, I, I, I've I've used all the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, we, I presume it sounds from the way you work. Your thing is always just to, you know, they're asking for something. I'm going. My job is to facilitate that. I think that you should always experiment. You know, uh, because often in my history, I've thought I was right about something, and then I was wrong. So it never hurts to experiment. Um, and it will be very, if you just experiment with these ideas uh, that your that your clients have, um, if they'll, if it doesn't sound good, they'll be like, oh wait, no, that wasn't good after all. It was cool like it was before, you know? But you wanna be the person that's kind of shepherding them through the experience and be ready to try things because, especially when you're working at the, like in the upper echelons of music, you're not the only genius in the room, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, people think, oh, I'm going to get a bunch of A and R, dumb A and R notes or whatever, but like almost always they're good, you know? And like more often than not, the feedback that you're going to be getting is going to be really good. And then sometimes there'll be things where you're like, uh, I don't really think that's smart, but just try it. You know what I mean? And then if they don't like it, they don't like it. Like, and, and there's plenty of times where it's been like, we try this thing and that thing. And then I'm, I'll am i be in an email like, yo, we've just drifted away. This is like nowhere near as good as like revision four. We're on like re revision 12. Go back and listen to that. And they'll be like, oh yeah, you're right. We're, we're like getting out of control here. So just make it a fun experience. You know what I mean? It doesn't hurt to try anything. And if you're working with really smart, if you're working with actual talented people, their ideas more often than not are going to be good. Um, now they could be like a super insecure person and like their own worst enemy that can happen too. And then you just have to figure out and do that in such a way where they feel like, um, you love their music enough to experiment things. You can always go back to like, every time you make a change, just do a new re revision and be ready to go back. Um, just make sure that your artists, everybody's working under the guise of, um, are we, do we have our mixer brain on or do we have our emotion brain on? And are we, is this, is this change coming because it's our, it, um, coming from a place of art or just a place of fear or whatever. And then just experiment, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I go, would always and, say just experiment. And go with the radar, as you said before, not does yeah. it sound good, but does it feel good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Jeff Ellis calling, uh, speaking to us from East West Studios, it's been magical. It's been a really, really great experience. Thanks for uh, having when, me on. When do you expect to be releasing Mixer Brain? Oh gosh. Um, I don't know. I'm like halfway through it. All right. Well, we'll hit you back when you finished it. We'll do the, okay, yeah, uh, we'll the go on yeah, a book tour, book tour interview. Yeah, um, be yeah, it's been great stuff. Thanks Jeff. And thanks Thank Trevor for jumping to the opportunity at the beginning. Uh, let's see where it goes from here. Okay, cool. Thank you.